the first slide you're looking at is a uh, double barrel retort. This was our first attempt at creating biochar on our own farm. And really, uh, if you're a home gardener, this might be an okay way to do it. If you had 50 gallons of tomato juice you're trying to turn into tomato sauce, this might be a good way to do it. But to tell you the truth, it's not a very efficient uh, way to do it. It's basically two barrels, one inside the other, a 35-gallon barrel inside a 55-gallon barrel. And after you get the fire started on top, you had a chimney. It was really quite exciting. We had flames shooting three to six feet in the air. Uh, it was putting out a lot of heat, a little bit more smoke than we would have been really happy with for the environment. And after a full 12-hour uh, burn and a complete cool down, when we opened it up, we had about 15 pounds of high-quality biochar inside. Now, biochar is really an incredible substance. This uh, is just wood that's burned in a very low oxygen uh, environment. And the crystalline structure is uh, so fine that this stuff kind of rings when you drop it. It doesn't go clunk, it goes ding when you drop it. As you can see, it's pretty big chunks. We had to transfer this into burlap sacks, run over it with a tractor, tried to turn it into powder. It was, it was a true learning experience, um, but not one that I would recommend for anyone who's doing more than a couple of rows in their home garden. And one of the things I'd like to warn people about uh, biochar, it's such a powerful substance. This is basically the same stuff that's in the charcoal filter on your sink. And you want to make sure that you inoculate this uh, stuff before you add it to your soil, or you can actually set yourself back a season or two by sucking all of the nutrients out of your precious organic topsoil. So this is kind of where the presentation really begins. This is one of the neighbors running his tractor, uh, disking as the vast majority of farmers in Hadley do season after season. You can see the huge cloud of dust he's, he's kicking up there. Um, and really, in our opinion, this is, this is one of the worst things you can do for your ground. This is grinding up the soil. This is making soil aggregation almost non-existent. Uh, it can lead to wind erosion, uh, puddling in your fields, and just, just a really a wide variety of problems. Same day, here we are on a Starte farm rolling winter rye. Uh, the contraption in front of the Kubota tractor there is a Rodale-style uh, roller crimper. And those fins that are on there are basically hitting each one of those rye stalks and crimping it in half a dozen places. Now, ideally, one rollover would kill the crop. Uh, really, even after three years, we're still learning how to use this machine. And one of the things we learned is that we really don't want to do it on a winter rye that's been left to stand like this. The root mass of the winter rye was still almost impenetrable uh, two months after rolling. It's, it's a wonderful cover crop, but not one if you're looking for an early summer or a late spring planting. That's the... That's the whole tractor with the roller in front of it to give you some idea of what, what we're doing. Uh, the machine on the back is, a, is an Italian spader. We used that machine for almost uh, 13, 14 years on the farm. And the rumor was that this spading machine was less destructive to the soil structure than a rototiller or a plow and a disc. But in our, uh, 
in our use of the machine, and because we're a small place, we're we're cropping sometimes two and three crops a year on each one of these semi-permanent beds. The effect was was virtually the same. We were uh, making a lovely fluffy seed bed when we'd run that spader over the soil, but after a couple of rains, uh, the soil would sink back down. As you can see, we keep uh, semi-permanent uh, grass paths in between our production beds, and those were being mowed continuously and actually rising and rising and rising, and the beds were sinking and sinking and sinking. And this was the most obvious um, to our eye experience of what was happening to our organic matter. We basically were only able to stay flat with organic matter, and we were uh, losing in soil structure the whole time. It was our naive hope that having these grass paths would provide uh, a good place for all of the biological activity in the soil, it would be a refuge for the earthworms. But really, we were just mercilessly beating up that soil, and uh, crop after crop, it didn't matter how much compost we were using, how good we were with our cover cropping, uh, we were just basically losing the battle on soil organic matter. So one of the things I want to do uh, with this presentation is show you some of the things that have worked for us, and I'm going to show you some of the things that haven't worked. I, I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you may have a hard time seeing what's going on in this slide, um, but we have been experimenting quite a bit with perennial cover crops. One of the crops that was recommended to us was thyme to use as a permanent cover on our production beds. And in this particular bed, uh, we had very good success with overwintered spinach. We had a lovely set of cuttings in the early spring. Um, we followed that with uh, some spring cauliflower, and the thyme was so aggressive, and I suspect that there's some form of chemical that is being exuded by the roots, and basically uh, the cauliflower turned yellow and just sat there. After the cauliflower, we tried tomatoes. Now, there's actually two tomato plants in that picture, if you can see the little spindly, pale yellow things. Um, and this was one that just flat out didn't work. We don't know if it's all times or only this particular time, which was gathered uh, out of a meadow uh, outside Hancock Shaker Village, and it, it may just be that it's this one time that's too aggressive, has too much stuff going on in the roots to grow anything. We've uh, made lemonade out of uh, the lemons here, though, because as you can see, this is a wonderful bee forage crop. We've had tremendous uh, pollinator and predator activity around all of these blossoms in the thyme. And it's one of the things that we've been trying to do on the farm is create more pollinator habitat, create more, um, more places for predators to get their little hit of nectar and be available for use in the field. Uh, this is an example of tomatoes grown with Roman chamomile. The chamomile was actually started uh, a month, maybe six weeks earlier than the tomatoes, was grown in four-inch pots in our propagation house, and then uh, there's two rows of chamomile on each, uh, there's a row on each side of the tomatoes, and this was a, um, this was a pretty good experiment for us in this first season with it. We had considerably less disease pressure in the rows of tomatoes where we had the Roman chamomile. It did a good job of spreading quickly and covering the bare soil, and, and we were pretty happy with it. Uh, again, that's season one. This is, uh, this is an example of what we've done instead of some of those grass paths. We've spent quite a bit of uh, time on riding mowers, trying to keep those grass paths in check. This is our garlic crop from 2000, 
15, I guess, uh, and we've put down sheets of cardboard and then covered them with wood chips. This has been a, a pretty effective method for us in the row. A lot of the times with the grass paths, we're getting intrusion into the beds and having to spend more time working on the edge of the bed than we would like to. Um, these garlic were planted in uh, a bed of compost and biochar mix. And then we used a paper mulch, which was pre-punched at about seven inches, rolled, rolled it down. We have three rows there. And again, covered with compost and a very light amount of wood chips. I don't believe any weeding was done on that bed at the time this picture was taken, which was probably early June. Uh, this little implement is something we picked up for uh, lessening the amount of soil disruption that we have to perform when we're digging garlic or carrots or other root crops. Uh, this is a bed lifter or undercutter. Excuse me one minute. Sorry about that. Uh, the bed undercutter, you have to basically dig a trench and drop it in at the end of the bed. And then the tractor creeps forward with this blade down, in this case, probably four and a half, maybe six inches deep. And it was really cool to watch the, the garlic would sort of lay back and then pop up straight. Uh, it just did the minimal amount of soil disturbance. Often we would be, in the past, we've been digging garlic with a garden fork and whatever mulch we had on top of the soil was completely obliterated. Uh, this is the crew picking the garlic. Uh, you can see the two trenches on either side of the bed where the bed lifter shanks have created some soil disturbance. Um, but this was a really quick harvest. Uh, the bulbs came right up easily. Most of the soil stayed in the bed where we wanted it. Uh, and it's a technique that we plan on continuing to use. Uh, this is a shot inside one of our high tunnels, some early uh, tomatoes that we had growing. And the reason I'm showing this is, that, again, this is one of our mistakes that we made. We also were experimenting with mixing uh, wood chips in with compost and using that as a mulch. Uh, it works really amazingly well, even as high as 30% wood chips. 70% uh, compost if you're doing it outdoors. There's a lot more weathering that goes on. Uh, in the high tunnels where we use drip irrigation, we ended up with way too many chips on the surface of the soil. And that became a problem for subsequent crops because if you dug a hole to uh, transplant something in there and too many chips fell into the hole, we were then looking at uh, nitrogen depletion. Basically, our thought on wood chips is that they, they are really a, an amazing beneficial source of nutrients and fungal activity for our soils. When the wood chip is in contact with the surface of the soil, there is a very minimal amount of nitrogen that gets sucked up in order to decompose the wood chip. But it's quickly returned to the soil if you're not stirring those chips into the bed itself if it's only on the surface. And we've had, uh, we've had very good luck using chips as mulch. As you saw in those previous slides, chips on top of cardboard have been a boon in the pathways. Uh, this was our second attempt at, at using biochar in our field. And this is a nice overall shot that shows the uh, bed layout that we've got. We basically have three foot wide beds and three foot wide paths. Um, this biochar was all spread with a shovel. And we were really lucky to find a source right here close by in Amherst, Massachusetts, 
a little company called Nextchar, and we purchased uh, this this biochar specifically for our 2016 uh, garlic crop. When uh, when we first started with biochar, we had we tried three different varieties, and some of them were incredibly dusty and difficult to use. Some of them were very fibrous and uh, and a little more uh, easy on the nose. This stuff is really kind of neat in that it's a nice, even, granular substance. Uh, that's my son spreading. He's not having to use a respirator. The only thing that we weren't uh, too thrilled with is, again, the hand operation because here we are spreading biochar, then we have to come back and we'll spread compost on top of that, and uh, it's, it's replicating number of trips up and down the field with the front end loader, not to mention uh, watching people walk around with shovels. So we're going to switch, uh, switch gears a little bit here now. What do we do instead of primary tillage? This is what we call an occultation strip. This is just a woven ground cover that we purchase in four foot uh, lengths, I'm sorry, four foot widths and probably 300 foot lengths. And we roll these out on the beds after we've harvested a crop and hold it down with a variety of uh, methods. Really, it's the holding down in our location that's been the most problematic. We've actually uh, tried pallets almost exclusively. The sandbags tend to break down in the UV fairly quickly. Uh, we're in a windy location, and it can be really discouraging to come back out into the field after a good windstorm and have to pick up and rearrange a number of these occultation strips. What's neat about them is they're a woven material, so moisture goes through them. Uh, the sunlight does not go through them, but oxygen does. So there's still all kinds of biological activity that's occurring underneath these strips. Uh, just this last week, we uh, had rolled some heavy cover crop that was planted uh, early in the spring and covered them with the occultation strips and we're going to have a wonderful mulch bed when we pull that off for fall planting. Uh, this is a picture of a section of the field and when we're doing it right, we're able to just move all of the strips over, four beds. Uh, that's what the ground looks like. You can see the bed in the middle has some rather long grass on the edges, and it is a trick learning how to mow beside those occultation strips without sucking them into your mower and making a giant mess. Um, but basically, the ground is ready there for an application of compost and then planting. So this was... Uh, a wonderful acquisition for the farm. This is an ABI Elite Spreader. And what we've got loaded up in there is a 20% biochar, 80% compost blend. And this has been a, a real boon for the farm. By mixing the biochar in with the compost and letting it uh, sit for a few weeks, you're basically pre-inoculating that biochar. Uh, the ABI spreader is tremendously quicker than spreading things with shovels out of the out of the bucket. I think it was taking us something like 45 minutes to spread compost uh, on a bed in the farm. We can now do uh, between three and four beds in an hour with one person instead of three people. And there are several shots of this uh, ABI Elite Spreader because it's, it's been a real boon. So here it is out in the field, dropping the uh, compost 
biochar blend. I just couldn't take enough pictures of that when we first had it. And then we're going to have a little a series of shots here of, of the stuff that makes me know we're doing something right. This is just wild mushroom crop. Uh, this is stuff that's popping up at the edges of our beds now. It's our belief that all of that extensive uh, spading that we were doing was just obliterating any chance of fungal activity in our soil. And we ended up basically with a bacterially dominated soil. And a lot of the real uh, magic in the natural world is what happens when you have fungi and plants interacting uh, down with their root hairs and mycelium. It's an incredibly complex situation. There's a transfer of sugars and proteins that's going on there that really leads to increased plant health and, uh, and just a much better uh, soil environment. A lot of our work has been inspired by the work of Elaine Ingham, whose Soil Food Web uh, website has wonderful rationale for all of this stuff. Um, we just, we love seeing it every time something pops up close to our bed, we know that we've got a, you know, the fruit of a mushroom is just the smallest thing that you see. The real action is all down in the, in the soil where the mycelii are going crazy. Now, this is a close-up shot of some uh, garlic that we grew uh, the year after we had peppers in a bed. So on the right, you can see an old pepper stalk there. Uh, you can see our wood chip mulch uh, not bothering us, not bothering the crop at all. And I believe that's Roman chamomile again in there uh, as part of our experimentation for perennial cover crops. Uh, this is a little further back shot of that same bed and wonderful to see the mushrooms sprouting up right there in that chamomile. So this shot is uh, working a little more towards where we're going. We've, we had really only limited success with our perennial cover crops. We haven't decided not to use them anymore, but we haven't used as many this year as we have in the past. What we're trying to get more of now is a continual presence of living roots in the soil in all of our beds. And it's, it's a challenge to have the correct plants ready to transplant when you need them. Uh, but we're seeing some pretty good results. This is the way we grow our basil these days. We're growing basil uh, as a companion plant with the tomatoes. It seems to be pretty beneficial for the tomatoes. We've had uh, the same problems that everyone else has had with the tomato downy uh, mildew, and what we're trying to do here is just get three or four pickings off of our basil, and then we're not that upset if we have to cut the whole plant off. It's been uh, low down work to pick the basil. It's not like the good old days when you could let basil grow 18 to 24 inches and just bend over to pick it, uh, but the quality of the crop has been good, and uh, it really does help us by keeping a variety of different roots in our beds at, at all times. Uh, this is some lovely stuff that occurs in our wood chips frequently. And I think the technical term for this is a dog barf uh, mushroom. I might- Slime mold. Slime mold is another good word for it. And slime mold, uh, it's digestion right out there in the field. It's really amazing to see how quickly it changes uh, and the effect that it has. You can see it's already breaking down there in the background. Um, it's not something you might want to roll around in yourself, but apparently the plants have been digging it. 
devil's finger mushroom, we only used to see them rarely, and now we're just seeing more and more of them. We only grow a couple of mushrooms that we try to harvest uh, for food crops. We've had good luck with uh, wine cap mushrooms, again, in the wood chips in particular. Uh, but really, we're just so happy to see the wide variety. This, the diversity of mushroom activity that we're seeing this season is really greatly improved. And again, more mushrooms that I can't even tell you what the names are, but I know they're doing a great job. So this next series of photos, uh, we've changed our cover cropping. We, we now no longer do winter rye because of that root mass that was just so difficult to transplant into. We now tend to use uh, oats quite a bit more we're transitioning into cover crop cocktails where we're going to use oats, peas, daikon radish, forage, soybeans, any of a number of different things. Um, we are still using the crop roller and crimper to put those crops down. And this also uh, is, has been a learning experience. How tall do you let the crop get? How hard do you let the seed get? Uh, what happens when you go a week or two too long? So this was looking pretty good before we put the uh, occultation strip on it. But if you look closely, you can see that the oat uh, seed heads are really well developed in this bed. And we had two beds that were uh, basically treated the same way, but we were about, uh, 10 days late on the second rolling. And instead of having a nice free mulched bed, we ended up with a wonderful crop of oats sprouting right up through the compost and the straw from the previous crop. And this was an example of being really lucky that we had a deli that would take little heads of lettuce, um, it actually worked out kind of nice in the end because this was a wonderful pre-seeded uh, late summer cover and uh, that bed's still looking pretty good, but for a big head of lettuce, it wasn't the right thing. So these are the, uh, these are the garlic beds uh, after harvest and after about four weeks maybe five weeks, and this is one of our first cover crop cocktail experiments. So we've got field peas, oats, and daikon radish. Apparently we have a, a, a volunteer squash plant, but I'm sure we didn't leave that. And what's really interesting about this is this was seeded last summer and had no irrigation whatsoever. Uh, we harvested the garlic crop, and we got in there pretty quick, so that would have been uh, right around July 15th that this crop went in. And there was, we were in the middle of a fierce drought. So this is showing a little bit what some of our no-till and what some of the biochar is doing for our soil in a dry year. That wonderful crystalline structure that I talked about at the beginning with, uh, with the biochar, they're really like little black sponges out there in the field and they will soak up moisture and just, just give it up when it's time to give it up. They also will soak up excess nutrients uh, and also give it up, particularly if you've got that uh, beneficial fungal activity going on in your soils. So we were pretty happy to get uh, this much germination in a drought year. And you might wonder with a no-till operation how we get those uh, seeds incorporated. Basically, we take a very small uh, Scott's seed spreader, like a grass seed spreader, and run the oats up and down the 
each side of those beds, we then take the old earthway seeder and set it up for either peas or radishes and run that. Uh, and as you run that down the bed, it throws up just a tiny bit of soil, just enough to get the oats to germinate. And we're off and running. I think, I think this one had at least three different cover crops in it. Uh, this is kind of a trade secret. I might, I might regret giving this one away, but this is our, the way we handle our fall tomatoes, our very late tomatoes. As everyone knows, there's a tremendous disease pressure all through the season with tomatoes. We're basically a no-spray farm. We're not using any copper. We're trying to stay ahead of the blights by having succession plantings of tomatoes. And this last fall planting, what we do is mulch really heavily with straw. We put that straw on as soon as the plants go out. There's absolutely no earth showing. So when we have those wonderful fall rains, there's no splashing on the underside of the leaves. And uh, it really makes a, a fabulous seed bed the following year when all of that rye is broken down. Uh, here's another picture that uh, is kind of highlighting one of our mistakes. We thought we could sell a whole lot of Thai basil, but uh, that turned out to be not the case. And we decided to just leave it out in the field in a, in a huge bed. And the uh, pollinator activity, the beneficials, and the predators were just feasting on this stuff. It was, a, it was a wonderful mistake to make. And here's another shot of how not to do something. Here's our occultation strip being held down with pallets. Uh, this is late in the season. That's all crabgrass, which is arched out over the occultation strip. And we were slow enough with the mower that we've let uh, a tremendous seed bank of crabgrass seed fall onto that occupation strip. Now, I would like to say that when we picked that up, we were able to pick it up carefully and just dump the seed into the pathway, but I know very well where all that seed ended up. So it is, it is a trick to keep the weeds off the edges of, of these occupation strips. We've gone to a gas weed whacker anytime we're not able to keep uh, the grass mowed well enough, and we're trying to prevent this from ever happening again. Uh, this is a shot of one of our uh, pollinator habitat beds, and uh, it does a wonderful thing for the farm. It's it's the diversity of species in there again. We've got, a, we've got a bed now which has got a half a dozen different kind of roots going on in there. We've got uh, continuous bloom all season long. There's something new blooming there. In some cases, we're able to get a second year growth right out of the same bed. Usually by the third year, uh, the wheat pressure has gotten a little too intense and we'll, ha we'll have to occult the, the bed and start over again. Uh, here's an example again of intercropping. This was a fall lettuce crop, um, and this was kind of serendipitous. I think we were seeding uh, daikon radish into some oat covers, and I had some seed left over in the little uh, earthway cedar, and I saw some bare strips of compost between three rows of lettuce, and we just ran the daikon radish right down those rows. The lettuce made nice full-size heads. We thinned the radish out to where it should have been spaced, and we had a late uh, radish crop right out of that field. One of the cool things about the daikon radish is what happens to it if you leave it in the field over the winter. Those deep, fat roots turn into little wells of 
gooey nitrogen. It's really, it's really been a wonderful late cover for us. And uh, we are going through a, a small list of mistakes here. So this is TEF and daikon radish. Uh, it was so dry by the time August rolled around last year that I thought I would try an Ethiopian grain for a cover crop. And by gosh, it did germinate literally without any rain. But I was, uh, I was really interested in it because it was going to be frost sensitive, being from Ethiopia. And I was looking for a kill down before planting garlic. Well, this is just a case of not thinking the thing through the whole way. Daikon radish didn't even blink when the frost came. And we ended up with uh, an interesting looking bed of dried, uh, dried teff grain with, with daikon radish that just wasn't given up. So this is what I would prefer to see now before a garlic crop. This is uh, buckwheat. And um, I'm trying to remember, I don't think we even covered this buckwheat. I think we just broadcast this right on the surface of the soil. Uh, and it's, it's a hardy crop. It, it likes to grow. And we had a good, uh, a good coverage on that. And of course, that did winter kill or frost kill very easily. And we had three nice beds for planting garlic right there. This is back to that teff. There's the radish that doesn't want to give up. I actually had to run the crop roller through there and try and break off the radish. I think I was uh, up and down those rows twice more with a shovel later in the, in the fall. And I still had daikon trying to push up through the garlic all this year. So this is a shot of uh, planting, I suspect that we're planting um, shallots in this five hole punched paper. The paper that we get is from the Sunshine Paper Company. And it's an OMRI listed paper mulch. Um, you can get it either in a creped formulation, which just means it's kind of crinkly and a little easier to use. You can get it in the pre-punched either five hole, three hole, or single hole. And we've used quite a bit of this on the farm. It, it gives you really two months of excellent uh, weed suppression. You occasionally get a weed coming up through the hole with your plant, but 90% of the bed uh, is really nice and clean. We, uh, if we have enough compost, we put compost down first, roll the paper out, uh, plant into it, and cover again with compost. We've also used uh, wood chips on it. This was an example of the very last bed we planted where we didn't have quite enough compost to cover it properly. I believe that's a garlic that's been planted in there. And we came in with some aged wood chips and put a light coating of wood chips on. And, and the crop did pretty well with that. So here we are again back to this season. Uh, this is again in a high tunnel looking at early tomato crop that's interplanted with lettuce and basil already in there. And this has been a nice way for us to get several crops off of one bed. You're getting a lot of soil uh, shading, which in the high tunnels particularly is helpful. This is keeping the surface of the soil moist and active. Um, and, and it didn't seem to hurt either crop. They, they were, there were three good crops off that one bed. This one's a little harder to see. This is actually tomatoes planted into some early spring beets. Um, it looks rougher in this picture than it actually was. The, the beets, the beets came out nice and the, and the tomatoes are often, often running. And the nice thing about this again is we've we've got the beetroots in there. We've got all of that lovely uh, soil activity going on around all those roots. And when we pull them out, the tomatoes are ready to just 
step right in and continue the good work. I think I'm going backwards. So this is one of our beds uh, from uh, late spring where we've planted uh, oats and field pea. And this is done that same way with a little Scott's uh, hand broadcast spreader, just walking up and down the two edges of the, of the bed, running the earthway cedar down to put the peas in there. Uh, and that has made a really wonderful uh, seed bed for us. Here's some of our early spring tomatoes. Again, planted on that pink paper. It's not my favorite color paper, but uh, it's OMRI listed and it does, a, it does a great job. In this case, we've decided to use the drip tape on top of uh, the paper, and that makes it a lot easier to find any of those troublesome uh, leaks. And that's what the same crop looks like when we've had some stakes in there and we've just run the irrigation. And that, I believe, is 45 minutes. So I'm ready to take some questions. So I'm going to ask Anna, how do I do that? <laughs> OK, no problem. That was a wonderful presentation, Dan. I do have a few questions that came in to me via text that I can read to you. Um, there was a question concerning the first couple of slides on the wood that, were you, that you were using. Is there a particular wood or type of wood that works better in that, um, in that machinery to make biochar? Uh, we were going for whatever was the cleanest wood that we had. Um, we, we tend to stay away from the tarry uh, woods. We don't like pine or fir that much. We had a lot of... Uh, hardwood cutoffs in that tank. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize is what's known as the soap test. If you are purchasing uh, biochar or making biochar yourself, you should grab some handfuls of it, rub it on your skin. Yes, your hands got black. The question mm -hmm. is, does it take soap to get them clean? Or can you just run them underwater and it's clean? Really high quality biochar will not have a lot of tars in it. It won't feel greasy under your fingers. It'll rinse off clean. If you have to use soap, it's probably not a high enough quality char to use in a garden. Very good. In terms of your biochar and compost mixture, there were two questions that came in on that. The, the compost that's being mixed with is that compost that you're creating? Uh, not generally. We don't do a lot of composting on the farm, and this is a little bit of a sorry tale. We had an excellent relationship with Martin's Farm Compost up in Greenfield. Uh, they were actually doing the blending for us. They were taking their product, which was approved for use on an organic farm, and mixing 20% biochar from next char, running it through their turner, and it was it was a fabulous material. Now they have unfortunately uh, recently been delisted. Um, they ran into a problem with some of the cardboard that they were using might have had colored inks on it, and they definitely had been using compostable plastic bags in their food scrap collection program. And that was a material that has not been approved uh, by the National Organic Program or the Organic, Organic Materials Review Institute. And so uh, until they can find a way to segregate those products, um, we, ha we are not able to use uh, them as a supplier of compost. And it, it's a bit of a heartbreaker for us because mm -hmm. it, it really did a super it made using biochar very much easier for us when it came pre-blended. Okay. Uh, we have two questions from our viewers. Um, do you have problems with slugs and mulch? And what do you, what do you suggest to deal with slugs? I don't, I don't think slugs have been as much of a problem. I, probably 
should have showed you one of the slides where we had little paper collars around all of our tomato transplants in a high tunnel. Um, it, is, it is really interesting. I've used straw in high tunnels. I've used wood chips in high tunnels. And occasionally, you will create really fabulous cricket habitat. And I had no idea that field crickets would eat tomato plants, but I can swear to it. They, they will just gnaw them right off at soil level as if it was a, a cutworm. And uh, the addition of the little paper collars basically solved that problem. And we're also happy to spread a little, um, and now I'm forgetting the name of the substance, but there's an approved. Uh, okay. It's oat brand with semaspore is the name of the product, and it's it's a fatal disease for crickets. So we now routinely uh, treat both our propagation house and all of our high tunnels and the surrounding mulched areas uh, with that semaspore bait. It's most effective early in the spring when crickets uh, are just hatching, but it will work at any time of year. Uh, slugs. I don't think we I don't think we have a major slug problem. We've had a little bit of a slug problem this spring because of the weather. Um, but in previous springs it hasn't been noticeable. And this is Annalise who's my production manager and, and really does all the hard work that you've seen the wonderful pictures of. I just talk about it. <laughs> all right. Uh, another question that was text concerning biochar and the biochar compost mixture. How many times will you apply that in a season? Well, we're learning this as we go along. And my advice would be uh, to go cautiously. Um, there have been times when we've been a little more gung-ho than I would like to. One of the problems with biochar is inevitably you end up with a certain proportion of ash. Ash acts very much like lime and will raise your pH. Um, so you want to be a little cautious. This is something that we're thinking of as a five to 10 year project where we will slowly uh, build the biochar presence in our soil. I would say ideally one application of a 20% biochar compost mix per season uh, would be plenty fast enough. Okay. Um, and one slide concerning the wood chips. You mentioned that you had actually spread too many. How did you make that correction and what do you suggest um, for farmers and gardeners as they're applying wood chips? What's the best way to handle that? Well, we just use a, we use shovels and forks to apply it. Um, we were working on some occultation beds this morning where we pulled the, pulled the strips up and moved them over. And there were a few places where I can't even explain why there's clumps of wood chips, but there was too many wood chips and we basically either go through with a metal rake and use it upside down, if you will, so the tines are pointing up and just pull the chips to the shoulder of the bed. Or we sometimes use a spring rake, uh, which is probably what we're gonna use in those garlic beds where we had to actually use a layer of wood chips for mulch and just, just rake them right under the shoulders kind of like the last picture that's up there, um, yeah, that bed when the paper rots, that's gonna have a few too many wood chips on the shoulders and we're just gonna rake it off to the side. It's gonna help uh, keep the weeds out of the bed uh, and we'll, we'll see some lovely soil under there. The, the wood chip and cardboard, gosh, a couple of places we've been extending our beds and when we put down a sheet of cardboard and cover it with wood chips, in the spring, the soil under there is just, it's like chocolate cake. It's just wonderful. Yeah, you, you do have to rake the chips off. You don't want to put those chips into the soil. But boy, it does a nice thing. We've also been pretty vigilant about using chips that are at least six months old. So sitting on the ground somewhere on the farm for six months so we know um, 
you know, what's happening to it, and we can check it to see if there is uh, mycelium forming in there. And I think we might have inoculated one or two piles last year just to um, speed up the process. But I think that's we keep a close eye on that as well. Okay. And uh, we have another question coming um, from a viewer concerning wood chips again. Is there a clear indicator when wood chips are no longer an issue if they mix with the soil? Um, I think it's when they're broken down. I think if you can if you can see the chip, it's better off on the surface of the soil than in the soil. Um, you know, we we're we're working on a six month time frame now. If we continue to have a good relationship with our tree chipper. I'd love it if we could get it out to a year. There's a lot of variability in wood chips, and the longer they stay in the pile, and we end up moving the piles around, you know, occasionally anyway, so they get a little bit of stirring. Um, but but the more decomposed they are, I think the happier everybody's going to be. Okay. Um, the strips that you refer to, the Aquitaine strips. Is there a, a particular brand that you suggest, and where do you uh, purchase yours? I think we've been getting them from Agricultural Solutions, which is a, a Maine uh, wholesaler, state of Maine wholesaler. I, I don't think I can give you a brand that I like better than another. I can tell you that the woven holds up better then I'm not sure what the other term is, but one time I used some stuff that was sort of pressed together instead of woven in, in carefully, and it it broke down under solar in uh, in less than six months. The strips, it looks like we're getting uh, three to four years out of the strips right now, and basically you want to look for some uh, some sort of UV guarantee before you buy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then our, our last couple of questions are concerning the uh, uh, types of cover crops and particularly the Roman chamomile. When do you, when do you normally plant the Roman chamomile? Well, we had the best luck with the Roman chamomile when we planted it early in the spring, uh, and I don't remember for sure whether we started in four-inch pots or if we transplanted them into four-inch pots out of a uh, 10 or 20 row flat, uh, but we started those, I would say, almost as soon as the greenhouse was operable, uh, no later than mid-March. If you, I didn't show you all of the mistakes we've made. We tried, um, we tried oregano the same way, and oregano just grows too slowly. Uh, it didn't spread enough. There was a lot of bare soil. There was quite a bit of hand weeding around around the oregano. Uh, the chamomile took off and made nice big 18-inch circles in one season. Um, the other cut, the other <laughs> warning there is uh, your second year, you have to be ready to either mow or weed whack the chamomile because at least in our soil, it was coming up 18 to 24 inches and actually shading the second year crops that we put in there. And we were just a little slow on the uptake to, to see what was happening. Uh, but it did set some things back. Okay. okay. And our final question concerning cover crops, is there a particular sequence? You mentioned um, several types. Do you plant those in a particular sequence, and when do you start? I, would, I wish I could say we had this figured out. Uh, mm -hmm. To tell you the truth, it's mostly do we have an open bed do we think we have two months of growth uh, window that we can we can do it in? And we seed the bed all at once. So when we put a cover crop uh, cocktail in there, usually we'll put the oats down first. Right away we go in and seed the peas and the radish. Um, we're always looking for new things to try. The buckwheat, the only problem with the buckwheat is letting it grow too big and flowering and creating seed. We don't really want that. Um, the other problem with buckwheat that we've, 
notice is maybe it's an attractant for Japanese beetles. So we've also been using uh, milky spore powder when we use uh, buckwheat as a cover. All right. Well, I think that's our final question for this evening. And I'd want, like to thank first Dan and his production manager, Annalise, for their time tonight. This was a wonderful presentation, very informative. And I want to thank our viewers and those who called in. I hope that you can take away a lot of information that um, you can use for this season and upcoming seasons. If you would like to hear more from Dan, he will be one of our presenters at the summer conference. So I encourage everyone to go ahead and get registered so you can catch his workshop. And I think he's doing a farm tour as well. Uh, this presentation will be up on NOFA's website within the week. So you can go back and replay it and show it to some friends. Um, next uh, month, the last Tuesday of the month, we'll hear from Ms. Sharon Gensler. And she'll be speaking about uh, carbon farming on a homestead slightly smaller situation. So I look forward to seeing everyone. Again, thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Dan for his presentation. And I pray that everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you, Anna. All right. Good night. Good night. Over and out. <laughs>